One of the most influential philosophers there has ever been was the Englishman John Locke, born in 1632. He's been generally credited with laying the intellectual foundations both of liberal democracy and of modern empirical philosophy. An empiricist is someone who believes that our conceptions about what exists can never pass entirely beyond the bounds of experience, that everything we conceive of has either been experienced or is constructed out of elements which have been experienced. Some version of this doctrine has been accepted by many of the greatest philosophers since Locke, and philosophy in the English-speaking world has never escaped its dominance for long. So familiar has it become that many people nowadays regard it as obvious, just plain common sense. But when Locke propounded it, it was an idea with revolutionary implications. Whether in philosophy, or the natural sciences, or politics, part of Locke's message always was, don't blindly follow convention or authority, look at the facts and think for yourself. In politics, this was revolutionary in an almost literal sense. In France, it had a decisive influence on Voltaire and the encyclopedists, and thus on the intellectual ferment that preceded the French Revolution. In America, the founding fathers had Locke consciously in mind and made repeated references to him when they were drawing up the American Constitution. Locke was educated at two institutions that are still there and still famous, Westminster School and Christ Church Oxford, where he became a don until his mid-thirties. He also qualified as a medical practitioner, and when he left university life, he became involved in both politics and medical research. In his own day, he was occasionally known as Dr. Locke. In the turmoil leading up to what the English call their glorious revolution of 1688, he had for his own safety to go into exile in Holland, and he was one of those Englishmen who followed William of Orange over to England to oust the Stuart kings. By this time, he'd been working for years on what was to be his philosophical masterpiece, the essay concerning human understanding. It was published in 1689, when Locke was 57 but it had the date 1690 on the flyleaf, and that's often mistakenly given as the year of publication. Also published in 1689 was A Letter Concerning Toleration. There followed in quick succession the two treatises of government in 1690 and some thoughts concerning education in 1693. Although Locke lived to be 72 and wrote other things, nearly all his influential writings came out in a period of less than five years. The next philosopher in the English language, who is still of international reputation, George Berkeley, was in part reacting against Locke, and it can therefore be helpful to consider the two together. Berkeley was born in Ireland in 1685 and educated at Trinity College, Dublin. All the philosophical works for which he is now famous were published when he was in his twenties. A New Theory of Vision in the year 1709, The Principles of Human Knowledge in 1710, and three dialogues in 1713. Some of his other works deserve to be better known than they are, but his fame rests on those I've mentioned. In 1734 he was made a bishop, and to this day he's often referred to as Bishop Berkeley. Much of his life was spent in public activity, some of it in the New World. He had connections with Yale University, where one of the colleges is named after him, and the town of Berkeley in California is also named after him. He died at the age of 67 in 1753 and is buried in Christ Church, which of course was Locke's Oxford College. Here to discuss with me the work of these two philosophers is someone whose writings about them have made his academic reputation, Michael Ayres, Fellow of Wadham College, Oxford. Mr Ayres, let's start with Locke. If anyone's studying the history of philosophy chronologically, as many people do, and so they come to Locke via his predecessors, one thing that's bound to strike them is the number of central ideas in Locke that had already been expressed by other people. For instance, by Descartes. I'm thinking of the, the notion of the whole world as being divided into minds and matter, as one example, or the conception of the whole universe as one gigantic uh, mechanical system, as another example. What is it about Locke that was distinctively different? Well, like Descartes, Locke was part of a, a movement um, in the 17th century to oust uh, the uh, previously dominant um, view of the world, which was the Aristotelian view. Um, and uh, 
central to this was, of course, the view of the world as a, a great machine subject to um, mechanical laws. I mean, composed of lesser machines, but all subject to the same uh, laws of physics, uh, necessary laws uh, of nature. Um, superficially, too, his theory of thought and uh, knowledge can look like Descartes. Um, he uh, explains thought as a, a series of ideas before the mind. Um, an idea is something in the mind or before the mind which represents things outside the mind. In reasoning, the mind um, confronts these ideas, so to speak, or is confronted by them. And uh, uh, his, his definition of knowledge is the perception of a relation between ideas. And this uh, intuitionist uh, uh, view of knowledge is, can look very like Descartes, uh, the view that in knowing something, we, as it were, grasp or perceive um, its, its uh, nature. On the other hand, there are very big differences. His um, chief among these, perhaps, or one of the chief uh, differences, is the um, status, the different status that he gives to the senses. For Descartes, the senses um, deliver certain data and they incline us to have certain beliefs, but these beliefs don't count as knowledge. Um, they have to be, the senses have to uh, be um, interpreted and uh, explained by reason before uh, we can suppose that through the senses we have acquired any knowledge of the wor world. Basically, the senses don't deliver knowledge. Uh, it's reason that delivers knowledge, or the intellect um, operating on the data of sense. But for Locke, the senses themselves are a, a basic or fundamental uh, faculty. They, uh, they deliver knowledge in their own right. And this shows in the different approach to skepticism uh, of the two philosophers. Descartes, so to speak, accepts the skeptic's challenge to supply reasons for believing in an external world, in a world of objects outside us. Uh, Locke simply dismisses the challenge. He says that the skeptic is uh, casting doubt on one of the fundamental faculties uh, of the human mind, um, and yet he himself in producing his sceptical reasoning is relying on human faculties. And uh, in effect, he rejects the whole thing. Um, he's prepared to say that if anybody is wild enough to be a sceptic, reasons can be produced, but uh, the senses don't need reasons. I mean, they just supply us with, um, with knowledge. Another thing uh, is uh, that I think one must mention as being central to Locke is his very special use of the word ideas. Yes. I know he didn't coin that, but he, in chapter one of the essay concerning mm. human understanding, he actually apologizes to the reader for the frequency with which he's going to use the word in the book. Can you say something about that? Yes, well, he, uh, it was in fact a very well used term by the time he used it. I mean, there's yes. nothing really new about it at all. But uh, for Locke, an idea is something very different from what it is for Descartes. But for uh, Descartes, um, it's something really fundamentally intellectual. For Locke, it's fundamentally something sensory. I mean, even if we're thinking about something that isn't, we're not actually perceiving, we have an image, something, a sensory image of that thing. And he explains even the most abstract thinking in these terms. Of course, it, his, his uh, theory has to get more complicated at this point. But basically, thought is for him the, the possession, the having of images before the mind. Now, this theory of imagism, as we could call it, uh, was not an uncommon one in the 17th century. And it had um, tended to have go in two, one of two directions. Um, one of these directions is taken by Hobbes. Um, that since all our knowledge and understanding was dependent on the senses, Hobbes produced a, a dogmatic uh, view of the world, which was a materialist one. Um, he thought that we could analyze experience in such a way that we could arrive at the sort of understanding of the world that Descartes thought we arrived at through the intellect. But Locke took a different, developed a different line of, which is more agnostic or um, skeptical, really that although the senses give us knowledge, they give us a limited knowledge. And because all our thought about the world is restricted to uh, 
the concepts that we have through the senses, and in fact our thought involves sensory images, uh, that restricts our knowledge of the world. And he thought there was no method by which we could arrive at the uh, uh, underlying nature of things. Mm -hmm. So he was a sort of modified skeptic. I mean, we know the world is there, but we don't know what it's like. Yes. This use of the word ideas and this particular theory of knowledge was so influential that I'd like to dwell on it just for a moment. And Locke thought, didn't he, that everything that was present to the mind was, in his sense of the word, an idea. And he used that to mean not just thoughts, yes. as we tend to do, but yeah. uh, sensory images, even memories, pains, emotions. Yes. Everything immediately present to the mind was an idea. Yeah. Now, when it came to our apprehension of the external world, uh, he thought that we didn't have direct access to objects. I mean, if I look at that table, mm. um, I haven't got that table inside my head. What no. I've got inside my head is a v visual image of that table. The light shines from the table onto the right. retina of my yes. eye. That transmits an image to my brain, and I have the experience that I call seeing the table. Mm. Uh, but the whole of my uh, experience, through all five of my senses, consists not of being in immediate contact with the objects of the external world, but of having images and representations of them. Now, yes. he never doubted, did he, that although that means that the objects of the external world out there are things of which I do not have and never can have immediate knowledge. Mm. He never doubted that they were out there, did he? I mean, he, no, he believed no. that there were material substances out there in the world giving me these experiences. Why was he sure of that? Well, uh, he, he thought it just didn't make sense to suppose that all there is, so to speak, a lot of sensible qualities. I mean, his model is that I mean, there is the object there. It's affecting us in various ways, and it's affecting other objects around it. And um, it's through its effects on us and through its perceptible effects on other objects, that's to say the objects in turn affect us in regular ways, that's how we have knowledge of this thing. And uh, so what for us is simply, we, can, we have to think of simply in terms of a sort of list of sensible qualities and, and uh, powers to affect other things and so forth. What's actually there is something really rather simple. Uh, but he believed that because he believed the world must make sense. He believed that the world is an intelligible place, that it is uh, governed by necessary laws, mm. and that um, it's ultimately the kind of place that an ideal science could explain and understand. Now, at the level of sense perception, although there are regularities, there are only relative regularities. I mean, we don't get that kind of absolute um, law-likeness at the level of ordinary experience that, um, that, that would uh, be the sign that we had arrived at the truth of things. It's, it's because we don't have a simple comprehensive science, really, mm -hmm. of things, that uh, he can be sure that the senses don't uh, give us knowledge of their nature. Now, you say that Locke believed that the world was the sort of place that a law like science could explain, but yes. I think the question still needs to be asked. If he thought that all, we, all the knowledge we have of things is this intermediate knowledge, that we, we immediately mm. experience images and sensations and representations, which in turn represent or picture yes. things, if we never have access to the things, how is a successful science possible? on Locke's view? How can we know what the nature of things is? Well, in a certain level, it's not possible because we can never be sure, uh, he thought, in his situation, at any rate, in the 17th century. I mean, he, he was really trying to uh, prick a lot of, lot of balloons, so to speak. I mean, he was trying to cut the pretensions of, of philosophers like Descartes, who thought that they really arrived at uh, a deductive science of things. What we're restricted to, in Locke's view, is speculation. Um, and we're, not only are we restricted to speculation, but we must employ in that speculation concepts that we get from experience. So um, there was, a, in Locke's view, a very good speculation to hand, but there was clearly something wrong with it, and that was Boyle's view of the world as a whole lot of little atoms, particles, uh, bouncing around and, and uh, clinging together and, and functioning mechanically. And he thought that's what the world must be like, that it would ex be Boyle's explanation of um, chemi chemical change, for example, that um, what 
if we, if we take a chemical substance and we see that it behaves in a whole variety of different ways in different conditions, then Boyle said, well, that's not because it just, so to speak, has an, uh, an arbitrary and contingent list of powers to affect other things in various ways, but because it has a certain structure, a certain mechanical structure, and because it, when it meets things of different varying mechanical structures, then obviously it's going to behave in different ways when it, when it interacts with these things. Um, now, Locke accepted that view provisionally, uh, but he thought there were certain questions it left unanswered. Uh, one of the questions concerned the particles themselves. I mean, why do atoms cohere as little unchanging things? It's all very well if you postulate them and then get on from there, but why isn't it the case that when one atom hits another, it doesn't fall apart or bits fall off and so forth? Um, so the problem of coherence was one of the problems that he raised. Um, Newton's Principia had been published just a few years before the essay, and uh, of course the inverse square law is an important part of Newton's when you, system. I think I'd better mention what that is because yeah. some of our viewers might not know, and that is that every object in the universe attracts every other object in the universe with a force which is inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. That's yes. it. Yes. Yes. Sorry, well, I mean, just an interruption, guy. I think one must yes. assume that everybody knows this. Locke yeah. accepted that yeah. uh, Newton had shown that this law holds, and he accepted that um, the probability also was that it holds absolutely universally. Yeah. But nevertheless, it seemed to Locke just like a kind of brute fact and not in a really intelligible one in itself. Yes. What science is explaining is not the inner nature of things, which, which we can't know, but how things behave, which we can observe, well, which we he, can experience. He, he, he thought that that's what, in the end, that's what Newton had achieved, yes. a, a, a sort of spectacularly good description of how things behave. Yes. And this interpretation was one that Newton himself was inclined to. Yes, and, yes, and in fact, in the second edition of Pincipia, he published after Locke's death, he um, introduced a, a number of philosophical passages which were pretty obviously heavily influenced by Locke. Yes, he said but, this famous phrase, I don't make hypotheses. That's right. Hypotheses yes. known fingo, that's right. and he was referring to that, wasn't he? Exactly. I just tell you yes. that there is gravity. I don't try to explain how it comes about that's that right. there is gravity. Yes. And so on for the whole of his science. Yes. One, the new science made absolutely prodigious use of mathematics, and from Galileo to Newton, and mm. above all with Newton, men began to understand that throughout the universe there are, so to speak, e equations buried in reality. Yeah. Uh, how did Locke uh, see this? I mean, how did he view the nature of mathematics and, through science, its application to reality? Well, his explanation of the possibility of mathematical science and geometry, say, mm. in particular, mm. is quite uh, really rather different from Descartes. I mean, Descartes, for, ge for Descartes, geometry is a part of the science of space. I mean, it's, it's a part of the science of reality. But for Locke, it's uh, a science, an abstract science, which is created by us. We, so to speak, pick off um, uh, geometrical, the geometrical properties of things and uh, we can construct them ad lib, and uh, we can create a sort of science for that reason, precisely because it's not really concerned with the nature of things at all, which is unknown. It's simply concerned, as he puts it, with our own ideas. Yeah. When we observe things, um, they affect us uh, in ways which cause us to observe, as we think, properties in the things. Mm. Now, Locke thought that these properties were all of two basic kinds, didn't he? That there were some properties in things which they possessed, whether anyone was observing them or not. Um, uh, he called those primary qualities, yes. didn't he? And that would include, I suppose, all the mathematical ones, the measurable ones. The mechanical ones. The mechanical yes. ones, yes. Uh, like the dimensions and the weight and so on. Yes. And there were other qualitative uh, properties, like sounds and smells and tastes and colours, yes. that he thought depended on an observer. We're beginning to gather the materials together for a sort of outline sketch of a whole picture of the world, and I'd like to draw the threads together before we take any more forward steps. It's really going back to the beginning of our discussion and, and taking it up to this point, that Locke thought that the world, as we experience it, consists of two fundamentally different sorts of entities, minds 
and material objects. That we can't know what these are in their inner nature, and in their inner nature these remain permanently mysterious to us, but we do have direct experience of, of what they do, of how they behave. One of the things that material objects do is affect us. They affect us through our senses, in various ways which give us experiences or representations or images of their properties and that we perceive their properties of being again of two fundamental kinds. There are the, the primary qualities which are the mathematical properties and the secondary qualities which are mind dependent mm. and, and, and of a sensory or qualitative nature. Now this sort of view of the world is, is extraordinarily close it seems to me to one which is still very widely held yes. and widely regarded as a sort of common sense view. Up to this point in the discussion though we haven't said anything at all about one thing which is of enormous importance to 20th century philosophers and was of enormous importance to Locke though we haven't mentioned it yet and that's language. Um, Locke, the, the, the essay concerning human understanding is written in four books and one whole book is devoted to the use of words. How did Locke see language as coming into or being related to our experience of the world? Well, I think I'd first like to just qualify your summing up. Oh, would you? Please yeah. do. I, <laughs> I don't, <laughs> I don't the, you to appear I, to I agree with the, it if you don't. The way you, the way you summed it up, you, you made Locke seem a little bit inconsistent. Oh, did I? Uh, because, uh, as a matter of fact, it's true. It, uh, he's inclined to think that the world is composed of matter and minds. But he is consistent enough to say that since we don't know the nature of either, we can't even be sure of that. Ah, so he is a very, uh, very ready yes. to accept the possibility that materialism is true, that, that we thinking things are in fact uh, complex and subtle machines. How we work, we have no idea at all, but we, he's, he's ready to accept the, the, the possibility that uh, there is no Cartesian soul, no um, immaterial, uh, naturally immortal soul. Yeah. Actually, I'm glad you pulled me up on that because he has an argument about that which I think is marvellous and which I still think carries its full clout today. Of us human beings, he says that one of two things must be true, but both seem to us impossible to grasp. Either we must be material objects that think and have emotions, mm. or there must be something immaterial in us which thinks and has emotions and is in that case mysteriously allied to a physical object, namely mm. our body. Now, Locke says, when we try to think our way through these two alternatives, we find that both of them are in a profound way unintelligible to us. Yes. And yet one of them must be true. Yes. Now, I, I, I still believe that. I think that's a good argument. Yes, the argument there is so strong that uh, one wonders why, uh, on other occasions, he says that dualism is probably true, but he never tells us why he said it, never justifies the probably. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you were right to bring that in. Yes. Now, let me try and move us on as I did before yes. to language. How does Locke's view of language uh, fit in to his view of our knowledge of the world? Well, uh, the book on language is really, I mean, a book on classification in all the various departments of, uh, uh, of knowledge, what makes for good classification. Um, the most interesting, I think, is, is the classification of the natural world. And uh, what he wants to do here is to reject the Aristotelian view that the world is composed of natural kinds and that science is a matter of identifying the natural kind and uh, examining the nature of each um, kind more or less separately. So um, you have to study the essence or nature of horses, cows, dogs, cats, and so forth. There just are these categories yes. in the world. Yes. yes. And um, he wants to reject that view, of course. Uh, but this has implications of classification for well, the you Aristotelian. Say, you say, of course, but somebody who hasn't thought about this before might not see the of course. I mean, uh, uh, I mean yes. aren't there, somebody might say, but there are dogs, or there are yes. cows, or there are horses. Well, well the of the course came from that? what went before. <laughs> the, the, the of course came from what went before, because yeah. the, um, um, given the view of the world as this great kind of mechanical object composed of lesser machines, then dogs and cats are little machines and they function according to the basic laws of physics. 
Um, so there isn't a separate nature of dogs and a separate nature of cats. There's a different structure, but the uh, nature of the, uh, is in, I involved is really the same. I mean, the laws of nature involved mm. are the same. Mm. Um, well, uh, given that view, I mean, his own view of the world as uh, that sort of place, yeah. uh, then uh, there could, he, he concluded that there were no natural divisions into kinds that there were resemblances at the level of observation and these resemblances caused us uh, quite reasonably to slice the world up but in the end the slicing is done by us it's not done by nature I mean for, Arist for the Aristotelian uh, there are these natural divisions natural species and we simply identify them and name them but for Locke uh, we do the slicing up and a consequence of this is that uh, the terms we use, like gold, water, uh, horse, dog, and so on, these are really arbitrarily, in the end, arbitrarily defined by us. A good they're, hu they're human categories. Yes. I'm what would he have said about his own distinction between minds and material objects that we've talked about so much so far? I mean, isn't that a distinction of natural kinds? Isn't that found in reality? and not just a distinction made by us in language? I, I think that would be, I mean, if, 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 I think he would agree that if that were, um, if but dualism if were true, if that's the yes. way it is, yes. then that would be a distinction of kind. Yes. Uh, the, the kinds that he's attacking are the uh, Aristotelian kinds, which are all um, bodily. I mean, there isn't in the Aristotelian philosophy um, anything quite like the, um, the soul of Descartes, I mean, yes, the, that immaterial yes, yes. object, substance. Now, if, if Locke thinks that our bodies are ultimately mysterious to us simply because all material bodies are in their inner nature mysterious mm. to us, and we're, and we're not even sure what our minds are either, mm. what view did he take of personal identity? What did he see people as being? Well, the um, discussion of personal identity is one of the most original and interesting parts of the essay. Um, he ag agreed with Descartes that one knew that one was a thinking thing, but one didn't know what kind of thing one is. Um, in the 17th century, the followers of uh, Cartesian modes of thought um, thought that a very powerful argument for their view was that it explained immortality that, uh, and, and personal identity that the identity of a person, despite the flux of matter, so to speak, in the body, the identity of the person is determined in life by the identity of the soul, and this soul could go on after, to the afterlife, I mean, and that would m constitute our identity then. Now, Locke started from uh, a, a different consideration, which is that immortality has to be personal immortality. The whole point of immortality is um, well, to put it bluntly, reward and punishment, mm. uh, with uh, a certain emphasis on punishment very often. <laughs> but the, uh, yeah. unless the, the thing that was being punished in the afterlife was conscious of the deeds that it had done in, the, in, the li in, in life on, on Earth, uh, then somehow Locke thought that punishment lost its whole point. So yes, it the, would be as if a quite different yes, person were being punished. Right. Like so yeah. he argued that, I mean, suppose we grant that there is such a thing as an immortal, immaterial soul, and suppose we grant that this um, receives punishment. If that thing has no recollection of what happened on Earth, the, the whole notion of immortality loses its point. So what really matters, Locke said, is not the, this supposed immaterial soul, but uh, consciousness, but the, the consciousness of the individual, uh, which you know, the continuity of consciousness, yes. the consciousness of, of the individual of its past, of his past deeds, and of course, in this life, what matters is um, the thought that it's going to be us who's mm. going, to, going to get punished in the in the world to come. In my introduction to this program, I referred to the enormous. Uh, impact that Locke's political 
philosophy mm. made, uh, it, both uh, in the period that Locke lived in and, in fact, ever since. It's always continued to have an influence. So I don't want us to get off Locke and on to Berkeley before we say something about that. Mm. One, one thing that I admire, in fact, I think the thing I admire most in Locke's political philosophy is, is the clarion call for tolerance. And at least one of his arguments for that is based on his insistence that, after all, we don't really know all that much in this life. We are wrong about a lot of things. A great deal is mysterious to us. And therefore, we are not justified in imposing our opinions on others by force. He has a very moving expression of that argument at one point, which I like very much, I must say. Yes, um, I think that is uh, an important uh, connection uh, with his uh, uh, views on politics and religious tolerance in particular. Um, he has a, what you might call an individualistic view of knowledge that uh, nobody else can do my knowing for me. I mean, yeah. I have to uh, uh, think things out for myself in order to have knowledge. Um, other people can pass on opinions. Um, now, in uh, certain areas, in uh, ethics and, and uh, religion, he thought that uh, people ought to spend time and ought to be given the time to spend on thinking things out for themselves as far as possible. And uh, if you have that coupled with a very strong sense of how difficult this is mm. and how hard it is to get things right, uh, then you've obviously got the recipe for a tolerant society. Yeah, we take it for granted, but of course in his day it was very far from being taken for granted. What, before we do move on, I'd like you to sum up in some way what you see uh, Locke's lasting contribution to philosophy, or mo that's too big a question, what you see his most important contribution to philosophy as having been? Well, historically, um, of course, something that you hinted at before, that he supplied a framework within which people could make sense of things like Newtonian science and so forth. And uh, a, 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 way, a way of looking at the world in which um, we recognize that there's a lot about the world we don't understand, and we recognize the speculative nature of science and so forth. Um, and that was very important. Mm. Um, he had another effect, which was that some of his arguments for example, his emphasis on the, uh, on the point that uh, what the knowledge we, we get through the senses is really just knowledge of things with powers to act on us. We don't really understand what lies behind those powers. Those arguments were employed by philosophers like Berkeley himself, who, who were really aiming at a quite a different kind of view of the world or philosophy from Locke's, but were able to Im make use of what to them were concessions concessions to um, idealism or to skepticism, I mean, to a different, quite a different sort of philosophy. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that Locke has a lot still to say to us, partly just because he was, so to speak, the last great realist before the trend, the te tendency towards uh, idealist, philo idealist yes. philosophy. Yes. And, and we can, I think there's something deeply wrong with idealist philosophy myself, and I think that well, it's very valuable to go back to Locke uh, as a sort of pre-idealist realist, and some, in some ways to see what went wrong, but also to see, uh, to pick up um, points which we've forgotten, which well, we've lost. I have much more sympathy with idealism than you have, but let that appear as it may. Let's now move on to the first of the absolutely major idealists, namely mm. Berkeley. And in a way, we've prepared the ground for the step we're now taking, haven't we? Because the philosophical doctrine that Berkeley is most famous for is his rejection of the notion of material substance. He just said there is no such thing. Mm. All we have is experience, and we've no warrant for inferring the existence of anything that isn't experience. Now, can you... I mean, that was partly a reaction against Locke. Can you... Does it start the discussion of his philosophy from that point? Well, the way you put it, you make Berkeley look like a skeptic, and he was, uh, I mean, he hotly contended that his philosophy was anti skeptical, I mean, that he w wasn't doubting that there was something out there, in a sense. But what's out there is not the material world. Uh, he, he wanted um, the world basically to consist of um, 
spirits. With he thought the, the whole of reality was spiritual. Well, the sensible world is given a very sub subordinate role. I mean, he doesn't mm -hmm. deny its existence, he says, but he wants it to be in some way dependent on spirits. I mean, there's God and there are finite spirits. His motive is fundamentally theological. Uh, to his mind, the uh, philosophers like Locke and uh, Descartes had turned the world into a kind of god, almost. The, the, turned the, 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 material the material world, world. Yeah. because matter is something which um, has a nature of its own which doesn't need God anymore in some way. Once God has created matter, it, it's like a great clock. It can go ticking on and uh, well, God goes on holiday. And this for, for Berkeley was a, a sort of atheistic doctrine virtually. I mean, a, lo a lot of philosophers had thought that, that uh, uh, materialism was was uh, a source of atheism and had attacked uh, any view which gave matter an e sort of equal status to spirit. I mean, uh, a group called the Cambridge Platonists or the Cartesians yeah. themselves yeah. were like this, had this view. But Berkeley was perhaps, well, one of the first to have the uh, idea of turning the tables on matter in a way by making the sensible world nothing but uh, so to speak, something which is mind-dependent. Um, so that Locke's distinction between the world as it appears to us and the world as it is in itself, mm. you see, mm. it, it, Locke, Berkeley just chops off the world as it is in itself, and all mm. that's left is the world as it appears to us. Mm. And he contends that he's not denying the existence of anything in this way, at least not the existence of anything that, uh, that counts or matters. How does Berkeley, if Berkeley thinks that, that there is no world as it is in itself, that everything is of the nature of spirits or mm. ideas or experience, uh, how, does he, how does he account for the success of modern science? I mean, how well, can there be a science if there's no matter? He thought, in a way, he could account for it better than Locke could, because whereas Locke was left with this worry about things like uh, the inverse square law being just a sort of brute fact, um, for Berkeley, all laws are just brute facts, and they are, in fact, they represent the order in which God affects us with uh, ideas, and uh, the sequence of ideas is, is, is what constitutes uh, the, law, the laws of nature. And he had his own story, uh, explanation of, of this sequence. This is, uh, he, his analogy is with language. God is, so to speak, informing us of what is to come in a way, so that if I see a fire, then I know that if I stretch out my hand, I'll get burned. And this is useful knowledge. Mm -hmm. And uh, unless the ideas which God um, uh, instills in us were, or, or, were um, uh, uh, unless they were, they, were, they were in this sort of order, then they would be useless to us. I mean, so he has this, uh, it's, it's a sort of, um, in fact, he constructs an argument for God's existence out of all this, mm. of course. In fact, so one could sum up Berkeley's view of total reality like this. There's an infinite spirit, which is God. Mm. There's a whole number of finite spirits, which is us. And we are somehow in communication with God via our experience that yes. what we take to be our whole experience of the world is in this rather poetic metaphor God's language to us God is talking to us yes and science all the regularities in the world all the scientific laws all the equations of mathematics yes. that are built into our experience are so to speak the grammar and the syntax of God's language they are the That's structure right. of the divine communication to human minds. There's no it's need. A magnificent yes. idea. <laughs> There's no need to postulate yeah. matter at all. It doesn't do any work. If all reality is mental, in Berkeley's view, uh, how is it that I can't choose what I see? I mean, when I, if I close my eyes and open them again, I can't choose to see Charlie Chaplin sitting on that sofa. Or I right. can't choose to see nobody sitting on the sofa. There you are, Michael Ayers. Now, <clears throat> anyone else would say, Locke would say, common sense would say, well, yes, that's because Michael Ayers is there independently of being perceived. Yes. Uh, Berkeley can't say that. At least he can't say that about all the other kinds of material objects in the universe. How does he explain it? 
in the end, he, he, he comes out which, with, with, with a notion which I, I, th I think was there in his earlier writing, but is not expressed uh, very clearly, that there is something that exists independently of you, and that is a, an idea in God's mind. Mm. And there is at least an intention of God <laughs> to uh, produce appropriate ideas in your mind when you open your eyes. Right. So uh, the, the real object is really explained um, in terms of the, both of the orderliness, the order of your ideas, and the, um, w what exists in God's mind as the basis of that order. But what is really important to Berkeley, you see, is not um, the leap from your idea to something else, for example, an idea in God's mind. Some people think that that leap has made Berkeley just as vulnerable as the materialist ever was to the sceptical argument. But the important thing f for Berkeley is that um, what he postulates is something mind-dependent, and it's also, he claims, more intelligible, because it's totally unintelligible, as Locke admitted, to us as to how matter should act on mind. But he doesn't have that problem because God's activity is something which is fundamentally unintelligible. In fact, it's the only kind of genuine causality there is in the universe, is the activity of a spirit, whether ourselves or God, for Berkeley. I think there's much more to be said for Berkeley than we're making it sound. I mean, <clears throat> this insistence that all that the objects of our knowledge can possibly ever be is the data of experience, and experience alone, mm came long after Berkeley's death to be one of the orthodoxies of science. And in fact, uh, Karl Popper has written a famous article called A Note on Berkeley as a Precursor of Mark and Einstein, yes. in which he extracts 21 theses from Berkeley's work, yes. which he then shows have been put forward by phys modern physicists like Einstein under the impression that they were saying something new and revolutionary. I think there is a lot more to be said for Berkeley than uh, one can easily be inclined to allow. Well, it's, it's perfectly true that um, there is a, a powerful argument for the view that our concept of anything must, in the end, come back to our experience of that sort of thing, however indirect. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that argument has been uh, very powerful. Now, of course, this, in a way, is Locke's argument too. But Locke uh, wants to say that doesn't mean to say that uh, there isn't something with its own independent nature out there. And Berkeley just wanted to sort of chop that off and, and deny that. I mean, for Berkeley, the world is not a mysterious place. Uh, he's a dogmatic philosopher. Um, it's a, for us, a rather, in his terms, a rather surprising place because there's no, m no material world uh, in the sense in which um, most people think of it. Um, but it's not a mysterious place for Berkeley, whereas for Locke, you see, he's prepared to accept that there is something mysterious there. Thank you very much, Mr. Ayers. <laughs>